board members, but an interesting side note, my family and I were in Nashville and we were at the Gaylord Hotel and I said, I know that person. And she was at a national conference there and there she was. So said hello. Um, and so she travels uh, quite a bit. Um, besides being on our board, um, she is a published author and her book is available on Amazon. So I looked at that. Uh, and as I said, she owns her own IT company here locally. Um, it is in Greensburg. And um, so we were initially going to have this uh, event on the 13th, but she had to go to a Chamber of Commerce meeting. So when you own your own business, you have to network, you have to speak, you have to get out and do a number um, of events. So she does that. And then, um, of course, when you're on a, a board, like with the WCCC College Board, you don't get paid anything. But in essence, the board members are the president's boss. And so they review um, different action items and so on. And Leia uh, really brings good points about like IT, uh, but you know, like bids and proposals and other things that they get here at the college. And so it's very, very helpful. The board meetings go along a lot better um, these days. So anyhow, uh, cultural programming, um, ask her if she could come. And so the day, today is the day she is here. And if you do not have a handout, there are some down here in the front, and I'll walk around and pass them out. And uh, I think that's it. But uh, like I said, we're looking forward to uh, a good presentation. Bob Saul from our business faculty is here. Cynthia Proctor, the, the dean of the business and math department. Um, Andrew Colosimo, who is a, a faculty member there and used to work in student services. So he is with us. So we have a, a good representation. And so I'll let Leah get started. Thank you, Michael. See what you didn't know. So you thought that I was just in uh, Nashville at a conference, actually. They have a new program on the board. They're sending us, you know, um, secretly across the country when you're not here to check up on you. That's what that was all about. So, all right, guys. It is my pleasure to be able to speak to you today on uh, entrepreneurship, starting your own business. Um, as uh, Michael said, my name is Leah Shilabon. I am also known as the IT Princess of Power. I own Intech Solutions in Greensburg. I started my company 10 years ago, but it's not the first company that I started. I started my first business when I was 23. Um, now you all say, everyone say at the same time, huh, there's no way you could have started this business 10 years ago and started a business at 23 before that. You look too young. Nah, all right, never mind. I was trying. Um, okay, so um, starting my first business, actually, I learned a lot about myself. Um, and if you ever start a business, you will learn a lot about yourself. Um, one of the key things I learned is that I can do anything that I really want to do, but I have to have that drive. I started Intech Solutions. Actually, we were um, living in Virginia at the time, and I had just had my third baby, and uh, my husband was working for an IT support firm, and he was really frustrated with the way that they were delivering service. And he kept coming home all the time saying things like, oh, I could do this better. You know, I have all these ideas and no one will listen to me. And um, I had, before that, I had a degree in psychology, and um, I still have a degree in psychology. And um, I worked in different human services um, kinds of things, like supported employment and um, uh, crisis teen shelter. I was actually a uh, public school teacher, teaching special ed for two years. And, um, you know, my husband's like, you know, can't we just move back to Pennsylvania and start this IT business? And I'm thinking, heck yeah, I mean, you're a genius, I can sell you. So we moved back to Pennsylvania in 2006 um, with a four month old uh, and two other little kids. I dropped them off at my in-laws house. I drove over to the Chamber of Commerce and joined the Chamber of Commerce, filled out some paperwork and sent it into the state to officially be in Tech Solutions Incorporated. I joined a BNI group, bought a house, and then called my husband in Virginia and said, hey, baby, pack your bags. We're moving to Pennsylvania, starting in tech solutions. And he was like, you, you bought a house? I'm like, it's all right, babe. I'm going to send you some pictures. And that's a true story. That's actually how we started in tech solutions. Now, I really don't recommend that you try to start your business that way. <laughs> Having a plan is actually much better than, you know, just being kind of headstrong like I am. Um, but, uh, but that is actually how it all went down. And so 
um, the, the quick moral, the quick lesson there is that um, you don't have to be smart or have a plan to start a business. You fill out a form. And so starting a business is actually easy. It's being successful in that business, making money and having an impact in the world. That's the part that takes a little bit of brain power. Okay, so before I go any further, that's, that's a little bit about me. Um, I'd like to know a little bit about the rest of you real quick so I can make sure that I meet your expectations when I'm talking to an audience. I want to make sure that I'm speaking to you and not at you. So um, let's see, we already know that we have some students in here and some faculty. Um, does anybody here, so why are y'all here today? I mean, I know you were like, Leia Shilabad, holy cow, she's so famous, I can't wait to speak to her and speak. Yeah, so I didn't know that wasn't it. So, um, so why are you here today? Um, anyone here because you have to be here, like for a class or something like that? It's okay, you can raise your hand, have to be here for a class. Um, anyone here interested in actually starting their own business, have thought about it? Okay, good. Does anyone in the room own a business right now? It's one person. Hey, cool. What do you, what kind of business do you own? Martial arts school? Oh, awesome. Cool. Fantastic. Did you say you own a business? Oh, don't? Okay. No, you're just taking pictures of me. Okay. All right, great. Um, so the first thing that you need to know about being an entrepreneur is that entrepreneurs, successful entrepreneurs, are lifelong learners. You are always a perpetual student if you are an entrepreneur. You love to learn. You love to learn more about your industry. You love to learn more about how to be a better business owner, how to treat your employees better, how to recruit better, how to market better, how to sell better, how to change your product to meet the market demands. You love learning. You are obsessed with it. Every successful entrepreneur. So let's start at the beginning and say, all right, so yes, I have this idea and I want to start a business with it. Um, the first thing that I ask people to think about is, um, you know, things like your mission, what your company values will be, and your culture. And, um, you know, a lot of the things that I've learned up until recently that talked about mission of a company I felt was kind of belaboring and dry. And I'm going to say that very honestly. But then I listened to this guy. His name is um, Peter Diamandis. And he's the founder of the X Prize, actually. And he was talking about instead of thinking about the mission of your company, call it your massive transformative purpose. Now, doesn't that kind of put a spin on what you're about to do? Yeah? So, I'm in an IT company. If my mission is just to fix computers, well, that's kind of a sucky mission, isn't it? I mean, I could put that there. My mission is to wake up every day and fix some computers. I mean, that really doesn't have any kind of transformative purpose on the whole world. But what is the company's real reason for existing? What is the purpose of the company existing? So think about that. What is your massive transformative purpose? It took me a long time to try to figure out what my massive transformative purpose was. And because I'm, a, I'm a really addicted to learning, a continual learner, and you'll find me um, listening to audio or reading a book um, anytime that I'm not actually working on or in my business. Um, in fact, on the way down here, I was listening to um, one of my favorite uh, podcasts, um, I Love Marketing. Anyone listen to podcasts in here? Podcast listeners? Maybe? All right, if you listen to podcasts, check out I Love Marketing. And check out 10x talks. Those are pretty cool uh, for entrepreneurial ideas. Um, so I was listening to one on the way down here too. I listen to it um, when I'm every time I'm driving. I'm I'm listening and learning. Um, and then like you know downtime when you're not doing anything else like doing dishes or in the shower. Hey, that's a really great time to listen to podcasts or audiobooks. Um, so anyway, so Peter said, um, oh, oh okay, back up. All right, so one of the books I listened to was a book called um, Exponential Organizations. And Exponential Organizations uh, was actually a, a case study that extrapolated into a theory about how we are seeing all of these firms recently that start up and then 24 months later, 36 months later, they're evaluated at like a billion dollars. In the past, you saw organizations taking like 40 years to be able to reach that kind of value. 
And now, you know, um, now the bar for all of you is set very high. If you, uh, you know, start your business and uh, in 24 months you are not making multiple million dollars, you are a complete failure. I'm kidding. <laughs> but it kind of makes you feel that way, right? Like when you see the Ubers and you see the Airbnbs of the world that like start up and then they're like, boom, huge. Everyone loves them. Everyone's using them. They've gone viral. So he said, okay, how, how is this? What is this phenomenon that's happening? How is it happening? He calls these firms exponential organizations. And then he identifies nine different things. And I probably should have written all of them down because I don't remember them all. He identifies nine different things that makes an organization exponential. And some of them are things like algorithms, uh, dashboards, um, shared resources, uh, instant communication across an organization. Hmm. There's a couple others, obviously, because that wasn't nine. But I was thinking then, um, wow, you know, a lot of these things like dashboards and algorithms and shared resources, I'm like, you know, we help companies to do those kinds of things through server virtualization or desktop virtualization. We um, offer companies shared resources. Instead of buying massive infrastructure, the infrastructure becomes digital or virtual. And so it's a shared resource. You know, we help to have um, to put the infrastructure in place for companies to be able to have software that will show them dashboards of how they're doing all the time, and um, and give them that. Uh, we're going to talk about KPIs in a little bit here, but uh, show those KPIs real time so they know exactly how their business is doing. And I was like, you know what? That is my my massive impact, being able to help other companies to realize their potential. So uh, I have a lot of customers who are manufacturers, and my massive transformative purpose is to information enable 200 manufacturers to help their businesses become exponential, because I truly believe in um, the manufacturing industry in our region that is the economic backbone, and if we don't make stuff here in America, we got a big problem. So that is my massive transformative purpose. Now... I don't necessarily recommend that um, you come up with core values right away because maybe you really aren't sure what they are. In fact, we had been in business for, I think, I think it was like seven or eight years before we came up with our core values. And we took two months and deliberated over them um, extensively about, you know, how really, what, what do we really value as a company? You know, everybody that comes into our company, we're going to hire and fire by our core values. If they do these things or show themselves this way, then, then they're a part of our team. And if they can't align with that, then they can't be a part of our team. So after, you know, eight weeks of this, we settled on five core values and I printed them out and I framed them up on the wall, big poster. And then six months later, right, we redid them because I realized we were saying different things. <laughs> and uh, that, you know, the, the core values that we thought we um, were, were really our core values, actually day to day, that's not what we kept saying. That there are words that we kept using were different about um, be efficient and deliver ele elegantly for our service to our customers. To approach everything with a positive attitude. Okay, that's really hard because if somebody calls us up, Nobody calls up the help desk to say, hey, how you doing today, guys? I just wanted to say hi. Yeah, they don't do that. They call because they're freaked out because something is broken. And uh, even if it's not your fault, because it's rarely our fault that something is broken, it's your fault. So approach everything with a positive attitude, is what we kept saying. So that went up on there instead. Find the root cause and solve the problem. Because... When we're helping people with their computers, it's really easy to put a Band-Aid on a problem and close that ticket and for it to go away, except Band-Aids fall off. And um, then you have to go back and fix the problem again. So when we're delivering solutions, um, we kept saying, you know, find the root cause and solve that problem. Don't just put a Band-Aid on things. And then we also found that that was something that we tried to do in our business all the time. If there was something that didn't feel right, then we were like, okay, well, what really is the problem here? Why are we having problem delivering this service? Or, you know, why are we feeling stressed out or, um, or some kind of uh, conflict in this area or with this project or with the way we're communicating? 
So that went up there out on the board too. So let me see, root cause solve the problem, positive attitude. Um, let me see. Um, great, I remember some of these people. I remember all my core values. Okay, find the root cause, solve the problem, approach everything with a positive attitude. And be efficient, deliver elegantly, continuous improvement. How can I forget that? That was one of our initiatives last quarter. Uh, we believe in constantly improving. So whether it's the tools that we use to um, for our business, uh, whether it's um, a, a process that we have inside our business, whether it's our, ourselves personally, how can we continuously improve? And we actually developed an initiative last quarter and um, constantly are putting things up, populating our um, our spreadsheet and working on those initiatives as many projects inside of our company to make things better. Okay, and your culture. Um, that will most likely arise out of the, the CEO, the person, the founder of the business. So, you know, if you have a laid back culture or if you're high strung or, you know, whatever the CEO is, you basically set the tone for your business. And, um, and kind of going into that, you have to make sure that you are attracting and, um, and hiring people who are good for your culture. Because especially when you're a small company, if you get somebody to work for you uh, who's not in line with your values or with your culture or just feels like they want to do things their own way, um, and that doesn't mean you're a dictator, obviously, but you have to have a process for everything so you have the same output every time. And if they don't decide that this is what they want, they tell you that, that that's what they want. They say in the interview, yes, 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 I want this job. I will do a good job for you. I promise I will do a good job for you. I definitely want to work for you. But then in real life, they don't do that. If you, in a small organization, like in a big company like HP or IBM, you can get hired there and you can hide. In a small company, one person will upset the apple cart of your company. It will stop you from being able to deliver your product or your service. So you have to be really careful with who you allow into your organization when you're small. Okay. All right. So, so those of you that are thinking about starting a business, can you yell out to me what you're thinking about starting or you just feel like you want to start something and you don't know what? Did you lie to me? Come on, guys. What are you thinking about starting? What was it? A wood shop? Uh, making like custom cabinetry or something like that? Okay. What else? One brave soul already went. That means you can all go now. What was that? Photography? Okay, good. What else? A bar? Okay. What else? Another bar? Okay. Young one's going to be flooded with bars. No, I'm just joking. All right. We need more bars. Um, all right. So you'll notice that when you start a business, you own all of the responsibilities of that company. You are the chief cook, head chef, you're the bottle washer, and you're the toilet scrubber. And I mean that um, in actuality and also, you know, more esoterically. So you have all of the roles, every single thing you have to do yourself when you start. And the key is trying to figure out the fastest way to pull yourself out of all of those roles that you're not good at and to offload them to people who are good with those roles. You also have to consider, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that more in a minute, but you also need to consider whether you are the technician or the entrepreneur with the vision, right? So um, it's really easy to, to see what that means in my business because we actually hire technicians. So my husband is the technician. He's my systems engineer. He is not like me. 
thank God. <laughs> I don't know. I wouldn't want to be married to somebody like me. I'm crazy. Um, so he's good at what he does. He's good at sitting in front of a computer, engineering, solving problems. That's his core competency. He needs to stay there. When he tried to do, get into more of operations and sales and marketing like me, it was painful for both of us because that's not what his competency is. It's not his strength. So before you go in, realize all those things you have to do. Realize what your core competency is, what your strength is. And by the way, your strength does not necessarily mean something that you're, you're good at or can be good at. You know, I can get my brain into like... Um, Oh gosh, I'm trying to think about some stuff I really don't actually like to do, but I can do well. Um, so process design, it's not something I love to do. I don't wake up in the morning and I'm like, I can't wait to go do some process design. But I can do it. I can get my brain, I can get to that place, and I can get really, really, really good at it. But it's not a core competency. It's not a strength of mine. So remember that. I can get be good at it, but it's not a strength. A strength is something that juices you up. It's something that in the morning you wake and you can't get out of bed, jump out of bed. I'm like, I can't wait to do this. What is that thing surrounding your business? That is your strength. The weaknesses are things that kind of pull that energy away from you. Like for me, that's going to be things that's tedious or, you know, requires like attention to a lot of detail. Things like accounting, things like going through invoices, which unfortunately I still do that piece. Um, things like the process design or workflows or stuff like that. It's not my core competency. I can do it. I can do it well, but it kind of like pulls a lot of the, the energy out of me. Things that make me personally, things that juice me up, marketing and selling. I never thought that I'd like selling. If you asked like this, this self 10 years ago, you, you know, in 10 years, you're going to get up in front of an audience. and You're going to say, you love selling. I'll be like, she's crazy. I am never going to say that. We're going to talk about that later, too, what selling really is. Okay, so, all right. So if you've decided that maybe you're a technician um, and that, uh, you know, you're not that driven entrepreneur, but you're really, really, really good at something and you know that you can build a great business because you have that skill set to be able to, to build an awesome company, consider whether or not it makes sense to bring on a partner or a co-founder who could really drive the organization the way that I did for my husband. Because in the, in the end, you know, it is your business, but it's not your business. You're here to serve. You're here to do something massive for the whole world. So if you're serving the world, then the business is about everyone else. It's not about you. And you never should feel like bringing other people in there that are better than you at things is a bad thing. Because if you're the smartest person in your organization, your organization has a problem. It's you. You're the problem. But you get what I'm saying. Okay. So. Um, all right. Let's talk a little bit about, so you have your business. Maybe you uh, filled out the form and sent it into the state, and now you got it, right? Um, I recommend um, having a strategic plan. And planning is something that takes a long time and a lot of practice to get right. Um, when I, I, I read um, Vern Harnish's The Rockefeller Habits, which is actually on the back as some recommended reading for you guys. If you're going to start a business, you need to read that book, period. Um, and uh, when I first started to do strategic planning, and they're like, okay, come up with some quarterly initiatives. I'm like, oh, that sounds nice and fun. Let's come up with some quarterly initiatives. All right, you have to figure out what revenue you're going to have for the whole year and then for the quarter. And I was like, okay, sure. How about a million dollars? Right? You're like, does that sound good? Does a million dollars sound good this year, guys? Yeah? Yeah, who doesn't want to make a million dollars, right? Um, but uh, so you notice at the beginning when you start to do planning that uh, you're really not basing it on anything. You're just kind of like grabbing it out of the air. It takes time to try to figure out how to plan right. But it's important because if you don't have goals, then uh, you don't know where you're going. And uh, so it's kind of like, you know, if you, um, if you get on a, on a plane 
in Pittsburgh. You expect that that pilot knows where they're going, right? Yes? Yes, that's an expectation. So if you were the pilot of your business, but you just kind of get in the cockpit and you just start flying somewhere, you don't know where you're going to end up, do you? You have no idea where you're going to end up. So you can't do that to your business. You have to have a plan. You have to know where you're going. Where's your, what's your roadmap to get there? And that's what your strategic plan is. Um, I So Vern has a, um, a, a format that he uses. He calls it his one-page strategic plan. I really like it. I actually don't do business plans, like, like pages and pages and pages and pages of business plans. Do you still teach business planning that way? OK. All right, it's all right. I'm only calling out your professor. All right, uh, just wondering. Um, so um, I have uh, Vern's one-page strategic plan. I think is kind of hard to fill in, especially if you are just starting out. So I started by using um, a framework that is kind of on one page as well, and it's called um, the Vision Traction Organizer. And it was put together by a man by the name of Gina Wickman. And I'm so sorry, I forgot to put that on the back. Um, that's another book that I really recommend reading. It's called Traction, and it has an accompanying book called Get a Grip, uh, also by Gina Wickman. I love that book because it's actually um, where the Rockefeller Habits gives you tons of ideas about how to um, structure your business, how to bring rhythms to your business, how to put processes in place, people, things like that. Um, but if you've never done it before, it's hard to conceptualize what that looks like. Now, uh, with Traction, he gives you the allegory, the story of, um, of a company implementing his ideas. And we're humans. And psychologically, we relate much better to stories. So if we're going to learn something, it's easier to, to see a story about it than just to learn facts and figures. So that's why I really recommend reading Get a Grip and then um, the accompanying book, Traction. So, um, so I use the, the VTO for our one-page strategic plan where we outline um, the mission, the core values, <clears throat> uh, the, uh, the purpose, the why we exist, who our target market is, what our business is going to look like in three years, what it's going to look like at the end of this year, including revenue and profit, uh, what, our, um, what our theme for the quarter is, what uh, our revenue goal for the quarter is, profit, and then some other KPIs. Uh, by the way, who knows what a KPI is? One, two. Those professors better know what KPIs are. All right. But no one else knows what a KPI is? Really? OK. That's all right. I didn't know either until, um, until I started this company. And um, I was in an organization called BNI. You guys heard of BNI? No. Okay, BNI is uh, is called it's a business networking international. It was founded in California by a gentleman by the name of Ivan Meisner. It's one of the I think it might be the oldest networking organization um, in the country um, that's founded on just for networking. They have chapters all over the world, and you get together every week and you um, give each other referrals. You can stand up and do a little commercial and say who you're looking for. And um, so the purpose of the group is to generate referrals for its members. Um, so I had mentioned earlier that when I started this business, I joined a BNI group. I had the ability to go to BNI's international conference in Long Beach, California in 2006. And I met Ivan Meisner. And you know, he, I think that networking is just huge in so many ways. Because if you don't get out and learn from people and connect with people, that's another way that for you to, to not grow. So he was like an idol to me. And so I got to meet him. And, and I was like, and I had, um, so he's really busy. He's running this international conference. There's like thousands of people there. And um, I really wanted to be able to talk to him. And I'm like, I'll talk to him whenever, whenever. And his, his assistant was like, OK. Well, you got the time from when he's walking from the conference up to his hotel room. I'm like, I'll take it, you know. So uh, I, I got to, I had like in my head, I'm like, okay, I got to make sure I know exactly what I'm going to ask him so I don't waste his time and I can get the most out of this. And, you know, so I remember I had a couple of questions and we're walking and we're talking and we're in the elevator walking and talking. And I'm like, okay, and my last question is, who would you recommend as a mentor for me? That's a trick question, guys. 
because I know he's busy and he's not going to break his brain. He's going to say me. And he did. <laughs> yeah, I know. Sometimes I got it. So um, he's actually the one that introduced me to the idea of KPIs. I had no idea what they were, even after you know, owning my business for a year. And uh, um, he sent me these forms. He said, you need to have KPIs. I'm like, what are KPIs? He's like, they're key performance indicators. I said, what are KPIs? What the heck does key performance indicator mean? So um, I didn't tell him that. But I didn't understand what that meant. Um, I started to do some research on it. And again, it took a long time for me to understand what a key performance indicator is. A key performance indicator is basically like a health check for your business. Like if you go to the doctor, they're going to measure some things about you to determine if you're healthy. What are they going to measure? What are they measuring? If you go to the doctor, how do they determine if you're healthy? They're going to measure what? Height, weight, blood pressure, what else? Cardio, your heart, what else? They're going to listen to your lungs, maybe take some blood work. And then from those stats, they're going to be able to tell, are you a healthy person or not, right? Because sometimes you go in there and you think you're healthy, yeah? And the doctor tells you, you know what, I'm really sorry you think you're healthy, maybe you feel like you're healthy, but you're not healthy. You know, your cholesterol is way through the roof, and you didn't know it. Or, oh my gosh, your blood pressure is so high, and you had no idea. So K KPIs are kind of like the same thing for your business. They're numbers that are generated that you can tell if your business is healthy or not, not just feel like it's healthy or not. So there's some KPIs that are going to be relatively universal, things like um, financial kinds of things, like how much cash do you have in the bank. That's really important because what you'll notice when you're a business owner is sometimes if you have like books, like your, your QuickBooks, and you're putting all your stuff in there, and um, depending on how up-to-date that is or how you are um, accounting for information in there, that might not really equal what the cash is in your bank. So you, you always want to make sure that you know what the cash is that's in your bank. Your cash position is really important. That's a good KPI. Um, your, your net profit, good KPI. Top line revenue, good KPI. In my business, other things that are also important are um, current number of support tickets on the board. Time to respond to a support ticket. Time to resolve a support ticket on average. Um, we also measure things like the number of leads this month, number of sales closed, number of new clients. Um, we measure things like uh, monthly recurring revenue. So um, that's actually really important for every business. If there's a way that you can find to make monthly recurring revenue happen in your business, and there is for every single business, even a bar, then you should do that because monthly recurring uh, revenue is not only guaranteed dollars that are walking in the door every single month, but it also makes your business valuated better if you were ever to go sell it or get it valuated to be able to borrow money. How am I doing back there, guys? Am I good? All right. I need to impress you, too. You teach this stuff. All right. So, and, um, and as I mentioned here on the handout, whatever is measured is improved, and whatever is measured and reported on improves exponentially. So if you're looking at this information, these numbers on a regular basis, then they will improve. Just like if you go to the doctor and you know what your cholesterol is and you know what you need to do to change it, and you will, and then it will improve. Or you, 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 know, you won't, you'll decide not to, and then, you know, you have a flatlining business. But nobody wants that. You want it to get better. So by the way, um, in case I didn't mention, I'm sure I didn't mention this, but this is also interactive. So if you have a question about something that I said, please raise your hand and, and ask me. Um, all right, quickly, I'm going to talk about um, some of the lows about owning a business because there's lots of things that can get you really high. 
You know, so if um, like when we solve a problem for a customer that's, you know, very complex or maybe that they've had for a long time and then they come to us and we solve this problem that they've had for years with their other IT vendor, oh, that's high, right? We were up there, you're like, yes, we were a hero, right? Um, when we make our goals, whether it's, um, you know, when we have a goal for um, how fast we respond to a ticket. And by the way, we review that information every week at our weekly meeting. Uh, so we, we made that goal. Yes, that's awesome. All right, look, look at those tickets on the board. It's going down. Awesome. You know, so those are the, the highs that you have. When you close a new sale, when you get new clients, when you, you know, the, those are the kinds of things that make you feel awesome. But you own the business and there's going to be things that make you feel not awesome. So have you ever heard of anyone say before when it comes to business to uh, fail hard and fail fast? Some people have, some people haven't. Yes, certainly. So it means exactly what it says. If you are in business, you will fail. There is something that you're going to do or many things that you're going to do that you are going to fail at, that you are going to fail miserably at, that might have an incredibly hard and harsh impact on your business. And I mean hard. I mean, it might leave you financially destitute. It might leave you in a place where you have to terminate employees just to stay afloat. You might screw something up for a customer so bad that you injure that customer in some way. Physically, if you have some kind of a business that interacts with them physically, mentally, emotionally, financially. It will happen. But the key is to try to make all your mistakes fast and learn from them fast. Because the bigger you are, yes, the harder you fall. If you are a $200,000 a year company and you lose half of your business, you are losing $100,000 in revenue, which is not hard to make up. If you are a million dollar company and you lose half of your business, how much are you losing? Half a million dollars in revenue. Which is more easy to make up? Right? Yes. So um, that being said, and, and I did too. I mean, I, I fail all the time. I absolutely do. My dad actually, I don't know if he coined the term or if he just heard it somewhere because he says it all the time. He called it failing your way to success. Right? Um, I have to admit. I don't like learn really well when other people are like, don't do that, Leia, you'll get burnt. I'll be like, what are you talking about? Oh, oh. <laughs> it's hot. Yeah, Leia, I told you it was hot. That's why I said not to touch it, right? So um, I have that problem. So it does take me, you know, failing sometimes, even though intellectually I do know the things that should or would happen if you make certain choices. Uh, sometimes I need to get burnt. So um, we were actually growing our business very quickly in uh, 2014. And, you know, I, reading all of my business books um, and being an entrepreneurial genius, I decided to bring all kinds of new levels of accountability and processes and measuring things into the business. And I thought I was doing a good job of helping my staff to understand the changes. Apparently, I wasn't. They just thought that I was a hard-nosed bitch. So um, that generated a lot of drama in my company. And, um, and actually, after a period of time, uh, caused one of my technicians to um, get fired on purpose. Um, after he got fired on purpose, he went to work for one of our largest accounts. Um, and he didn't stop there. <laughs> yeah. I must have really pissed him off <laughs> because uh, he also uh, got one of my other technicians to quit in the middle of, um, of a very big implementation. And uh, so he resigned by email at 9.15 in the morning, uh, leaving us, you know, without like, you know, so like way understaffed in the middle of a lot of things going on. And he didn't stop there. Um, he actually got into his car and drove around to our largest accounts got out of his car, went inside and said, hey, I just want to let you know I don't work at Intech Solutions anymore, and they're having some problems over there. Yeah. So um, that resulted in, um, in the loss of 
62% of our revenue in the fourth quarter of 2014. So um, would I have preferred for that to happen a lot sooner than that? Absolutely. But let me tell you this. Like I said before, I only learn very hard and expensive lessons. <laughs> so this lesson was uh, tailor made for me, hard and very expensive. Uh, what I learned was humility. And that's something that every CEO has to have and co-founded. You need to have humility. And I'm not saying that I was arrogant by any stretch of the imagination because I wasn't walking around strutting my stuff thinking I was hot shit. But humility is understanding that you have to think about everybody else first. You have to have the culture of your organization first. You have to have everything has to be about everybody else except about you. If you're going to make a change, you have to think about the impact that that has on your company. All of those things that happened, it would have been really easy to play the victim and to say, ah, you know, this this jerk that I hired just decided to go do all this stuff and and you know, now I don't have a business anymore because he decided to do all these things. And um, and I refused to do that. I took responsibility, said, you know what, it's my fault. It's my fault because this is my company. And whatever happens here is my fault. If we are successful, it's my fault. If we fail, it's my fault. And then it gave me that humility to look back on what we had done and realize the ways that I could have done things differently and better so that we didn't end up in that situation. I have those skills now. So that won't be happening again. <laughs> but it did take going through that um, in order to actually learn. Okay. So that's my failing story. So fail. <laughs> so don't don't do that. All right. So next, I'm going to talk to you guys about marketing and selling. Are you guys learning about marketing and selling in your business in business classes? <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. So I'm going to give you two definitions for marketing and selling. And I don't know what they teach you in class. I really have no idea. Um, so uh, if, I'm, if anything I say is contrary, you can yell at me later, guys. So I'm, I'm going to posit to you that marketing is, is uh, not flashy ads. It's not cool design. It's not branding. It's not exposure. What marketing really is, it's educating your prospect and providing some kind of value in advance so that they know you, like you, and trust you, and they are compelled to buy from you. So if you're Coca-Cola and um, you want to just like spend millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars, you know, just putting your name in different places so that, you know, people can see it, whether it's on TV or on a billboard, then Coca-Cola can do that. But I'm telling you, if you have a small business, in other words, you have a company that's under 500 people, then you need to think about marketing in this way. It's education. It's providing value in advance. It's showing that um, that you have what it takes, and that a consumer should buy from you, or a business should buy from you. So there's a variety of ways that you can do that. You can do that through networking. Um, you have to have a good website. I don't care what business you're in today. You need to have a website. You need to have a web presence because in our world of digitization, instant access to the internet just about anywhere except inside of WCCC buildings for some reason. It's all right, we're getting that fixed, I promise. 
Um, and, uh, you know, and the drive to the internet, you have to have a website that speaks to your target audience. Nothing that's flashy, nothing that's pretty. If it feels good to you, it doesn't mean it's a good website that's going to speak to your audience. You have to know who your target is. Think of, you know, who is the ideal client for me? You know, so um, just out of curiosity, I own an IT company. We fix computers for businesses, not for people, like regular, like consumer people. Um, who thinks that they know who my target audience is, just from telling you that? Who could posit a guess on that? Any small business? Wrong. <laughs> but good try. Yeah. Anyone else? Restaurants? Hey, a little bit more specific. You're not correct, but you're on the right track, right? Apple? I hate Apple. But, but I would still love you. All right, so that's the idea. So you have to figure, figure it. So if I say any small business, then I'm not going to be able to, I mean, I can't cast a wide net and catch every small business, can I? No. Because if some people, if you can't be like vanilla ice cream. Vanilla, everyone likes vanilla ice cream, right? Yeah? Does everybody like, you know, Rocky Road? No. But people that like Rocky Road, man, they love that Rocky Road, right? So that's what you got to be. You can't be vanilla. You can't cast a wide net to your target audience. You have to be very specific. Who is it that you serve? So before I mentioned that um, my massive transformative purpose was to information-enable manufacturers. So I can tell you that my avatar client is a manufacturer, CPA, or a law firm in, in southwestern Pennsylvania who has between 10 and 200 computers, is growing, and is looking for a partner to work with them in their IT to help their business to grow and become exponential. Typically, my, um, the person who makes a decision is either the CEO, um, the CFO, or an operations manager. Typically, they're between 40 and 50 years old. It's kind of split between men and women, but I would say it's probably on the man side. And um, I'm really specific about who I won't take and will take. On my website, I actually have a letter. If you scroll down a little past the um, fold, you see a little, it says, Dear Colleague. And then it starts to go about who we like to work with and who we just won't work with very well. Because honestly, there are some customers that really suck and you just don't want to work with them. They take a lot of your time and your energy and your money. So your marketing needs to, to educate them on who a good client is for you. And it says specifically in there, you know, we're not the cheapest. We work with you as a partner. We need to know about your business, about your business processes. We see ourselves as an extension of your business. You know, if, if that doesn't appeal to you, don't come knocking at my door. And we don't take everybody because I'm not going to bring somebody into my company and then, you know, have all the technicians, the phone rings, and they look at the phone and they're like, who's going to get that? All right, that, we had clients like that before in the past, <laughs> and they take up so much of your emotional energy. They're so not worth it. So your marketing needs to educate people on who a good customer is for you. And when you do that, it speaks to them. It speaks to them. Don't be afraid to be specific about who you want to work with. If you go to my website, it does say at the top, are you a manufacturer, CPA, or law firm in Western Pennsylvania who, and then it goes on from there, you know, who um, is fast growing, you know, all, all of my qualifiers. And people are afraid to do that. I actually, um, I belong to an industry organization. That's actually why I was sent in Nashville. And um, I mentor a group of um, IT business owners from around the world. We meet every Thursday on a video call, and we talk about a lot of things in our businesses, especially marketing our business and putting that message out there. And uh, they, they all are so afraid to narrow their target market because they think, if I don't catch a wide, cast a wide net, I'm going to miss people. What if I just put that I just want manufacturers in my website? Then I'm going to, and what happens if, if somebody else from a me medical practice gets on there and they're not going to call me? Okay, that will not happen. <laughs> 
you'd be surprised. I mean, I, it says those three organizations on my website. Last week, I got four new prospects in one week. One of them was a visitor's bureau. One of them is an electrician shop. Let me see. One of them is a church. And uh, the other one is a medical practice. None of those were my headline on my website, but they all called after going to my website. Why? Because they read the letter and they understood that, that you know, we're about quality. And they don't really care so much that it says manufacturer at the top. They want to work with someone who gets them. So, and you can always say no to business if you want to. If someone called up and they just weren't a fit, I could just say no and I could refer them to someone else. All right. So let's talk about selling. Who here likes to sell? Raise your hand. Oh, no way. You guys like to sell? Yay. Professor in the back likes to sell. All right. You guys really like to sell? It's funny because I don't make, I mean, I don't meet a lot of people that like to sell besides the salesmen that I meet. So I used to hate selling. I used to hate it. Because for me, when I would think of the word selling, I'd think of like this, you know, oily used car salesman that's just trying to get me into this car and sell me something I don't need and pressure me. You know, that was what I thought of when I thought of selling. So I didn't like to think of myself as selling because to me that just had negative connotations all around. But then I, I kind of switched up gears in my head before I found this definition, which says it beautifully, and realized that I'm not selling computer stuff to people. That's not what I'm doing. I am providing solutions that help their business. I used to be afraid to sell a switch that cost $500 because I know I could sell them a switch that cost $200 and they'd be all right. I'd be afraid to go in there and tell them what they really needed because I was afraid to ask them to sell what the, the things that they did need for their company. The engineer, my husband, would configure a server, it'd be $7,000, I'd be like, babe, can't, can't we cut that down? I don't wanna have to go in there and tell them they need a $7,000 server. He's like, this is what they need if they want their software to work. So I had to get over myself and realize that I am not selling stuff. I'm not looking for the most expensive thing. I'm not looking for the cheapest thing. I'm looking for the right thing, whatever the right thing is. And I'm providing a solution. I'm filling a need. I'm allowing this company to be able to function, to be able to be more efficient, to be able to not have to worry so they can just get on with their business. And when I put myself in that mindset, I'm like, man, I love selling. Who's the next person I can provide an awesome solution to? I can't wait now. When somebody calls and they're like, hey, I want to talk to you about a server, I'm like, yes. I mean, just on Friday, actually, I happened to uh, call up uh, um, that, uh, that electrician company because I knew that they were with another IT support firm. He mentioned last year that um, they were just signed a year contract. And I put him in my tickler system. And so I called him on Friday and he was like, you know, it's so weird that you called this week. Because we were actually about ready to buy two servers and, and get a new support contract. I'm like, really? Can I be there in two hours? <laughs> and I did. I went there two hours. Right before I went over to the uh, manufacturing reception at the ATC. Yeah. Friday was a big day. So um, absolutely, absolutely love to sell. So what is selling then? Selling is getting someone intellectually engaged in a future result that is good for them and to emotionally commit to take action to achieve that result. So let's break that down. To become intellectually engaged, so to, to come with you on it, so you've already educated your customer, hopefully in advance through your marketing so they understand why they need your product. And now you're helping in a conversation when you get in front of them to have that intellectual conversation so they understand better why they need your product and they need it from you. And you want to then get them engaged in a future result that is good for them. Now, if you're trying to get them engaged in a result that is bad or not so good for them, what you were doing is manipulating. And manipulating is not good. <laughs> um, and then you want them to emotionally commit to take action to achieve that result. 
Because even though we all say that we don't make purchases on emotion, nope, nope, nope. I was totally intellectual on that. I made a spreadsheet. I made charts. I looked in five places to find out where the cheapest thing was or whatever you did. In the end, we all make selling decisions or buying decisions on emotion. And then we intellectualize our choice with logic. I didn't come up with that, by the way. Would have been nice, huh? All right. All right. So, uh, and one of my one of my um, mentors, Joe Polish, who does the I Love Marketing podcast, he says to think of marketing as storytelling and selling as influence. In fact, um, on the back of your sheets, one of the recommended reading was uh, Cialdini's book Influence. And it really breaks down to you how we are influenced as humans. It's psychological. You just, it's a click whir thing, he calls it. You don't, you, you try not to sometimes, but these are just patterns we fall into psychologically. Interesting side note. I have my, um, my uh, copy of Chadini's influence from when I was in college. One of my professors in psychology required us to read it didn't actually read it all back then. <laughs> Shh, don't tell them. But um, I ha also have it on audio and still kept that book from college. And uh, it is incredibly valuable uh, in business. All right. Actually, my God, we have the time. What time is it? Oh, geez, 15 more minutes. All right. Okay, so next thing let's talk about fiscal management. How many of you here just love to do the books? You're like, I can't wait to pay bills and do the books. Accounting's so much fun, right? Uh huh. Okay, so the thing about fiscal management is that you have to do it for your business because if you don't, then um, you're going to be in a lot of big trouble in a lot of ways. Um, the first thing that you want to do before you start a business is make sure you get your fiscal house in order personally. Make sure that things internally in your life are where they need to be before you start your business. Because if you don't have good skills in managing money personally, it's going to get a lot worse when you start adding zeros to the equation. So um, I recommend if you haven't read Dave Ramsey at all, Read Dave Ramsey. The Total Money Makeover is a great book. If you get it on Audible, um, the audio book, he actually reads it himself, and he's a character. It's a joy to listen to. He's funny. But you have to be able to understand how to manage money if you're going to have a business, because when you start, it's going to be you managing it, and you have to have good ideas about money. You have to Figure out how to have a plan with money so that you can tell your money what to do instead of at the end of the month wondering where it all went. Does that sound familiar to any of you? Like, crap. When's payday? I don't know where it all went to. Also, remember that top line is for vanity and bottom line is for sanity. That means... When somebody asks, so how big is your business? And you're like, ah, I got a $5 million company. I don't, by the way, but it's in the plan. Um, but you're like, oh, wow, I'm so impressed. You have a $5 million company. Yeah, but you know, if your company's operating, operating in the red, in other words, if you're losing money this year, having a $5 million business is not impressive. It's scary and sad. If you have a $100,000 business, and, you know, once you take away all of your expenses for the year, you walked away with $10,000. That's not that bad. That's pretty good. You're in the black. Bottom line, your profit at the end of the year is really what matters. Top line is just for vanity to show off how, how much revenue you can generate and really is so not as important.
Okay. Other things. So I already talked about how cash is king. You have to know what's in your in um, in your bank account at all times. Um, so once you've read Dave Ramsey and you have a better idea about how to handle your money, I recommend that personally, I recommend that you read Mike Michalowicz's Profit First. Now the idea that all business people will tell you, business schools, business everybody, is that you know what, whatever accounting program that you use, Peachtree, Sage 50, QuickBooks, some ERP system, that you put all your numbers in there and that's how you manage your money. But let me tell you, entrepreneurs that have companies that are under $5 million, we do not manage our money by our books. We manage our money by our bank accounts. It's human nature. It's what we do. Don't fight against it. Try to make it be something that it isn't. It's going to happen, period. So what Profit First does is it, they have you set up several bank accounts, and you decide a percentage of the money that comes into your your main account gets dispersed to the other accounts in that percentage every single week. Those other accounts, he recommends a lot of different accounts. The ones that we have at our company, I have uh, one for taxes. So um, in case you guys didn't know, I'm sure you know, because I'm sure a teacher told you, um, you have to pay payroll taxes and you have to pay sales tax. And uh, both of those organizations that you pay those things to get really angry at you if you decide not to pay those things. Um, and when you take that money in, if you just see it in your bank account, you um, might be tempted to spend it or forget that you owe a tax bill. So for me, that money, it goes into a tax account every single month, so I'm never worried about paying payroll taxes or sales tax or end-of-the-year taxes for federal, state, for my business. I have one for payroll, and that's just payroll, not payroll taxes, what I have to pay my employees. Because um, when you own a business, if times are rough, you pay your employees and you sometimes don't get paid. But you have to pay your staff first. And you always want to make sure that money is there to be able to pay them. So we have a payroll account that that money goes into. And then I also have a profit account. And a certain percentage is, is drafted over into there every single week too. So at the end of the year, that's my bonus. It's already there. I don't have to get to the end of the year and be like, okay, what's left? Right, because you've been planning for it the whole year. It makes you feel so much better. It takes a load off of your shoulders when you don't have to worry about paying those big fat bills to the tax man and to your employees because it's already there. Now that brings me to the next thing, which is uh, my bookkeeper does that all for me. I love my bookkeeper. She is fabulous. She loves what she does. That is her her her. her, her core competency. That's what makes her excited. She gets her kicks off these numbers and making everything balance out. I mean, when she meets with me, she just gets like all excited. She's like, oh, I'm so excited you gave me a piece of information. I wasn't sure how that balanced out. Now I do. I'm like, thank God I love you because I hate that stuff. But she's been a lifesaver. She actually goes in there every single week and she drafts them those percentages into the different accounts. I don't have to think about it. I don't have to worry about it or have anxiety about it. It's just done. And then I know money is there for those bills to be paid. Um, she also makes sure that everything is balanced properly. She brings to my attention if we have accounts that are overdue for receivables. Um, as soon as you can, if it's not your core competency, as soon as you can, get a good bookkeeper, a solid bookkeeper. Um, my bookkeeper charges between $80 and $65 an hour. So worth it, I'm telling you. So worth it. So worth it. Um, and then uh, also consider who you're taking money advice from if somebody's giving you advice. Whether it's your mom or your dad or um, a well-meaning friend, someone that's been in business for a while, whether it's your banker, like think about who's giving you that advice and weigh that and take it with a grain of salt. Don't necessarily take it all as, um, as uh, you know, the word to follow. Um, bankers, it's in their best interest for them to sell you more stuff, whether that's opening more accounts or giving you lines of credit or things like that. And they're going to say nice things to you sometimes like, oh, well, if you, I'm going to give you this line of credit and I'm going to give you this credit card and then it's going to be, it's what you can do. You can put stuff on the credit card because you can like, you know, buy your equipment for your customers and then they don't have to pay you in advance. And then... At the, when that's due, you can pay that from your line of credit, 
And then when the customer finally pays you, you can pay off the line of credit. Okay. Guys, do I like numbers? <laughs> no. But man, did that sounded good at the time. <laughs> it's like, that makes sense. oh, I can, you know, can spread stuff out. It sounds really good. Yeah. Um, so think about that too. Because bankers are going to try to sell you anything they can product wise, and maybe it's not the best idea for your company. And cash is always king. Don't try to rely on other people's money. Try to be the bank and have cash. All right, so the last thing I wanted to tell you guys is that uh, in the back, I think you already found it, um, I have a lot of recommended reading. I know you're all like, yay! So excited, Leah, we don't have to read them up in college. Um, so uh, the the ones I, have put, I told you about on the front are really, really, really important, and uh, you need to read those. Um, the E-Myth Revisited by Michael Gerber, he really il illustrates the idea of the difference between the technician and the business owner. Um, that's why that one's good. The Charge by um, Brendan Burchard. Um, Brendan talks about um, the difference between um, trying to, to bridge the gap between you know, why you feel like you can't achieve your dreams. Uh, Mastering the Rockefeller Habits, I already mentioned that. Think and Grow Rich is a, is a classic. Uh, Napoleon Hill um, interviewed, I think, like hundreds of successful entrepreneurs and millionaires and then wrote this book on um, how to be rich. Interesting thing is that Napoleon Hill died poor, but um, it still has a lot of good concepts in there. And sometimes an idea is is all you need to be able to get to the next level. Um, and the other ones down here are just really, really, really good uh, supporting books to read in your free time um, to um, to uh, to give you a lot of ideas about how to run your business better. Who by Jeff Smart on um, hiring people. The Ideal Team Player by Patrick Lencioni. Actually, anything by Patrick Lencioni is really good. Uh, Charisma Myth about being charismatic for your business. The Speed of Trust by Stephen Covey. Obviously, all his stuff is good. Scrum is pretty cool. It's the art of doing twice the work and half the time. Wouldn't we all want that? Uh, the Checklist Manifesto is uh, actually the book that I read that made me all go all crazy about um, processes in the business and checklists and things like that. But the book is very well written and it really illustrates how you need those processes in your business. The Ultimate Sales Machine is awesome. Chet Holmes. If you start a business, you must read that book. Influenced by Cialdini. How to Win Friends and Influence People because you got to be nice. And the question behind the question is awesome. It's a very short book, but it's uh, poign poignant and it tells you um, really how to look at the question that people are asking when they're complaining about something or when they have an objection to something. All right, so I know I've threw up a lot of information on you guys. We touched on a lot of different things. Honestly, tip of the iceberg. I could keep talking for the rest of the afternoon, but I know we all have important things to go do. Is there anything that uh, you have a question about you'd like me to go into in more detail? I, I yes. Absolutely. You know what? That is that is really pointed that you picked that out because when you hear, <laughs> we assume that when we see somebody who's successful, that everything they touch turns to gold. And we didn't see, you know, the five businesses in their graveyard that failed miserably before they hit something that did turn to gold. That, or, you know, you think it looks like gold right now, or the and the. Um, the hard path they had to take to, to be able to get it where it is. You see a successful person, you just think that that's the end of the story. 
everyone has stories that are similar to mine. No, they didn't make the same mistakes that I did. But every single one of them does have stories like mine. Yes. Okay, as far as starting a business in the IT world or working in the IT world? Okay. Um, so my industry, is, IT, is changing very fast. Every single day, something is new. Every single day. Actually, lots of things are new every single day. Um, if you want to go somewhere where everything is incredibly fast-paced and you have a lot of demands on you and um, <clears throat> you have to continuously learn, IT is a great place for that especially if you're good at things like logic. Um, things that are really important right now are things like um, cybersecurity, obviously, since everybody has data that's digital, and that data um, is interesting to, to um, malicious actors. And uh, people, some companies tell me, oh, um, you know, they're not interested, what would they be interested in that I have? Okay, there could be so many things. Do you have social security numbers? Do you have birth dates? Do you have addresses? Those things are interesting to, to malicious actors. Um, do you care about your data at all? Because if you do, it's interesting to them because they can encrypt it and then make you pay thousands of dollars to get it back. That's pretty lucrative. Um, so where is the industry going? The industry um, is going to continue to get faster, bigger, better computers. We're going to see a lot of applications going more and more and more cloud-based more mobile based um, and uh, you know this is going to be technology is going to be ubiquitous you know between the internet of things where all objects are going to have sensors of some kind and talk back to the internet um, you know it's <laughs> there are so many things you could do for technology you can help support business customers you can support their infrastructure you can support a piece of software you can write software you can write video games you can um, you know, get into the Internet of Things and sensors and start having helping people to have self-driving cars and, um, you know, have you guys seen the, um, oh shoot, what's it called? The little Amazon button that you can put like on your, um, on your washing machine if you realize you're getting low on detergent, you just push it and it talks back to the Internet and then Amazon will just send you some more detergent. Like, it's amazing. I get chills. The things that we are doing nowadays. Yes. That's a good question, tech support for smart homes, because obviously the, the home is going to become more and more technology-based and more smart. Um, so what is that going to look like for tech support? I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> but at some point, you know, right now it's pretty simple. It's kind of add-on, right? So you got the Amazon button, and Amazon supports that. Maybe you have a Nest, you know, one of those um, um, devices that you can look back at your house and maybe change. So will there be a time where we have manufacturers that are creating an entirely smart home and you have you know, one manufacturer or one organization that you go to for tech support and you have to deploy people to fix those things. I'm not sure. It hasn't happened yet. There, I mean, the future can be anything. If you dream it, go do it. Seriously. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, <laughs> so if there is an opportunity to make money, then a crook will take advantage of that opportunity. In the old days, it used to be hard. You have to actually find the people that have the money and then put a knife or a gun to their throat and say, I want what you have. Now it's so easy. I mean, you could just, seriously, it's, it's amazingly easy. There are places that you can get crimeware as a service. You don't have to be that tech savvy. You can buy the code, you know, fix it up a little, and then go deploy it, and, and you can start making money. I mean, that's, that's the world we live in today. It's not going to get any better because we're always going to have crooks. We're going to have people that want, that don't care, that are not ethical, that just want to take. We're always going to have those people. 
That's why we have to continuously come up with ways of making things more secure and watching our backs. Okay, sorry guys. It was a pleasure to, um, to talk with you all. You have my contact information if you um, want to get in touch with me, link with me on LinkedIn, or have any questions. Thank you.